So you've got yourself some continuous data. You want to make a comparison of means across several groups. Maybe you get the sense that you shouldn't be using multiple t-tests in order to do this. You would be right. You want to use something completely different, which just so happens to be one of the most popular methods in statistics. That method is called ANOVA. Keep watching and we'll discuss this here. I'm Richard and this is Richard on Data. So I do assume if you're watching this video that you have at least some familiarity with the hypothesis testing framework, as well as the difference between Z and T tests. If not, I'll have links in the description to tutorials that I've done on just exactly those topics. But presumably you know that the t-test can be used to compare one mean to a pre-specified value, or you can use it to compare two population means. Suppose you have two groups, and you want to test if the means are statistically different between these populations. You'll calculate a test statistic like this one. That test statistic is going to follow a t-distribution with a certain degrees of freedom, and you can use it to calculate a p-value. That's when you have one or two groups. But what happens when you have three groups? I'll give you a concrete example. Let's suppose we have three different diets, each of which has a group of people who go on it, and we record everybody's weight loss after six weeks. How do we go about comparing the three diets? Well, one thing you don't want to do is start setting up three different t-tests. That is, one for diet A versus diet B, one for diet A versus diet C, and then one for diet B versus diet C. Basically, let's assume the null hypothesis is true across the board, and we're using a significance level of 0.05. So there's no difference whatsoever between any of these diets. Then, if you look at any one single one of these tests, the probability that we don't make a type 1 error is 1 minus 0.05, or 0.95. That's just for one single test. If we're doing this three times, then the probability that we never make a type 1 error is actually 0.95 to the third, that is 0.857. So the probability that we make at least one type 1 error here is 1 minus 0.857, that is 0.143. That's not ideal at all. So we call this the multiple comparisons problem, and there's tons of different ways that you can attack this type of problem. Several of them will be the subject of future tutorials that I do. But one of the most popular and straightforward ways to attack this problem is what's known as ANOVA, which stands for Analysis of Variance. This will give us one single comparison of all of our means, and it fixes our type 1 error rate at 0.05 for this test. So before I get into this, take a moment to hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and hit the notification bell so you never miss an update, and then I'll have a link in the description of the video to my Patreon account, and if you guys would be willing to support me over there, it would be massively appreciated. So just like its name implies, ANOVA is actually a somewhat counterintuitive shift away from comparing means directly, and a shift towards comparing variation instead. Note that when I use the term variation here, I'm typically going to be referring to, within some group, the sum of all the square differences between the observations and their mean. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the variation within the different groups, versus the variation between the different groups. And we're going to begin with a null hypothesis that all of the group means are equal. Then the alternative hypothesis is the logical contradiction of that. That is, at least one of the group means is different from all of the others. So there are assumptions of ANOVA to speak of. First of all, you're assuming that all of your groups are independent of each other. That's the most important one of all. You're also assuming that the variance within each of these groups are equal. Now you can check this by using Levine's test in R, or failing that, just by eyeballing box plots of the three groups. Now in this case, small discrepancies aren't necessarily the worst thing in the world, but if you have some groups that have radically higher or lower variances than others, it can certainly cause problems. You're also assuming normality in all of these groups. Honestly, this one is a technical assumption of the test, but if you don't have normality, but your sample size is large enough, this one generally isn't too big of a deal. 
Now that we've got that out of the way, let's dive back into the two different types of variation. So the first one is typically called sum of squares groups, also known as sum of squares between, or sum of squares treatment. This is equal to the sum of square differences between the group means and the total overall mean of everything. And as the name suggests, it measures the variability between the different groups. And there are k minus 1 degrees of freedom associated with your factor that defines the different groups, where k is the number of groups. So in our example, where we have three variants of a diet, we have 3 minus 1, or 2, degrees of freedom associated with the diet choice. More on this in a minute. Then you've got sum of squares error, also sometimes known as sum of squares within. This is the sum of squares between each of the individual data points in each group and that data point's corresponding group mean. Now again, as the name suggests, this measures the variation within groups. This is going to have degrees of freedom equal to n minus k, where n is the total number of observations and k is the number of groups. In this example, I have 78 observations and three groups, so my sum of squares error carries with it degrees of freedom 78 minus 3, or 75. Now we have two more terms to be familiar with, and those are mean square groups and mean square error. And all we have to do to calculate these terms is divide the respective sum of squares term by its corresponding degrees of freedom. So mean square groups equals sum of squares groups divided by k minus 1, and mean square error just equals sum of squares error divided by n minus k. Now what we end up with is two weighted quantities that represent the two different types of variation. That is variation between groups and variation within groups. Now mean square error is one of the most important terms here, and it's actually an estimate of your overall population variance. So if you take the square root of it, you get what's called root mean square error, and that's going to be, obviously, an estimate of your overall population standard deviation. Last new quantity that you need to be aware of is the F statistic. And this is just a statistic that follows an F distribution. Here's a picture of that distribution. You'll see that it's skewed to the right, and it's a strictly non-negative quantity. This is equal to mean square groups divided by mean square error. So literally, just think of this as a ratio between two different types of variation. This is going to vary dramatically, but let's just assume your null hypothesis is true and that all of the group means are equal. You would then expect that the variation between groups is pretty close to the variation within groups. So you would expect to see an F statistic close to about 1. Granted, it may be closer to like 0.5 or 2, but it's not going to be that far from 1. But if you have some high value here, that's going to tell you you have a lot more variation between groups than within groups, and that's going to be the foundation for rejecting a null hypothesis. So this F distribution is going to have two parameters, which are equal to your two degrees of freedom terms. That is K minus one and N minus K. A p-value, as always, is the probability that you observe a value as extreme or more extreme than you did, assuming the null hypothesis is true. So in our case here, with an F distribution, it's always going to be the area to the right of the F statistic that you observed. Now, in fairness, there are F tables out there, but they tend to hurt your eyeballs a little bit reading them. And honestly, it's just easier to use statistical software like R. So let's look at a real example. So here's an ANOVA table from that diet data. Let's work here from left to right. You guys already know the respective degrees of freedom terms are 2 and 75. Sum of squares groups is 71.1, and sum of squares error is 430.2. Divide these by 2 and 75 respectively, and we end up with 35.55 and 5.74 for our mean square groups and mean square error terms. Divide mean square groups by mean square error, and we get an F statistic equal to 6.197. The p-value is the area to the right of that, 
that is 0 0.00323. So we decisively reject the null hypothesis, and clearly it appears that at least one of these diets is different from the others. Your next natural question is probably, how do you figure out which one of the means is different? Well, you could just eyeball the box plots or just look at the means, but the best way to do this is to then break out the pairwise t-tests after we've already completed the ANOVA. I'll include some R code for this whole exercise, which will be available on my GitHub repo. The link to that will be in the description. So that covers one-way ANOVA, that is, the situation where you're comparing multiple different groups, where you have one single factor that defines all of the different groups. Now there are multiple extensions of this, the most common one being known as two-way ANOVA, but these are the subject for future tutorials. At least now, you know the fundamentals. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please consider sharing it, hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm, and then I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.